let's see, I'm in chapter 1 of Matthew. I'm in verse 18. This is, of course, a very famous uh, story uh, in the birth story of Christ. The Christmas story is uh, Joseph. Uh, and it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And that's very important to, our, to this passage. Notice 18 through 25 is the context. And the context, this is all about now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, but it's about the story of Joseph. When his mother Mary had been, a betroth been betrothed to Joseph before they came together sexually, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Here's something interesting, and you'll see it on your paper, but there's no definite article with the word Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person. So when there's no definite article with him, the English put it in there to make sure that you understood that they were talking about the Holy Spirit. But when you don't put it in it, and it looks like it's required, it's not, the emphasis is not on the person, it's on the work. Just, and so there is no definite article with this, even though they did put it in the English, the emphasis, and she was found to be with child by, meaning the source of, the work, the conceptual work of the Holy Spirit, right, to be with child. Joseph, her husband, and it gives, gives a description of him, which is, uh, and I want you to see four parts. Now watch, here's, here's, how, here's, how, here's how the Lord described him. Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, that, that not only is he born again, but he's a spiritual mature believer by righteousness, not just positional, but experiential. And, um, for a husband, betrothed, right? Betrothed husband. In other words, the, the legal contract is there. They still have to have the wedding, but they're legally contracted for marriage in that society. Betrothed, Joseph, her husband, legal, uh, being a righteous man, not willing to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. Joseph, her betrothed husband, being righteous, not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away privately. He's going to divorce her privately not make a big public deal out of it. And when he had considered this, th by that this means, and, after, and when he had come to a conclusion about what he was going to do, he, look, look, we'll talk about it, but he had two choices under Mosaic law. He can divorce her, and he can do it publicly or privately. Uh, he can have her stoned. It carried capital punishment. He could do it publicly or privately. He chose divorce, and he chose privately. When he had considered this, made a decision on what he would do, which was divorce her privately, uh, because he didn't, because he was motivated by not wanting to disgrace her anymore than she had already disgraced herself. Do you, do you see how he's thinking? Okay. Um, when he had considered this, come to this, how, how, come to a conclusion how he was going to handle it. Behold, an angel of the Lord, probably Gabriel, based on Luke's account, we don't know, because he's called, this, but he has been so far the lead teaching angel uh, of Messiah. So we just throw that in. An angel of the Lord, not the angel, but an angel of the Lord, a teaching angel, appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, that identifies him with the Davidic lineage of Christ, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, number one. Number two, for that which has been conceived to her of her is of the Holy Spirit, two. She shall bear a son, three, 
and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. Look how it started. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. And when it went into a discussion. Now look at verse 23, 22. Now all this. See what I'm saying? Do you see that? Now all of this took place. That which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled saying, and he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child. She shall bear a son. They shall call his name. Look, look at verse 21. What did he tell him to call him? Verse 21. What did he tell him to call him? Right? Look at verse 23 because you missed it. Look at verse 23. Look. Who's calling now? They cha he changed. It's they. See, the people. He's talking about the people. Israel. You see what he meant? Isaiah. I, this Isaiah 714. See, we have a switch here. Yeah. In verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus, and this is why. Agreed? But he switched it. This Isaiah prophecy was to the nation of Israel. Isaiah, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 28, all messianic, three signs to Israel of the coming of judgment in regard to the first advent of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about it tonight. Behold, a quote, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, translated. This is the he, this is in Greek is where you get the word hermeneutics, the word translated. You get the word Greek word for and uh, translated God with us. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Is God with us. That's what it means. Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Whoa, uh, Joseph, go big boy. I love that. I love that. Right midstream. Right midstream. <laughs> In about face. And midstream had come to a conclusion about how to handle this thing. God interrupted it. And said, look, mm -mm. and he went right with the plan of God. Isn't that wonderful? Joseph rose from his sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife. And he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Right? He wasn't told to call him what? He was told to call him Jesus. <laughs> Who was going to call him Emmanuel? Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be clarity to Israel. See, Emmanuel, theologically, when you do a study of Emmanuel, theologically, out of Isaiah, you know what you come up with in the church age? Hypostatic union. Undiminished deity. And Look. We know that this God with us, this son is going to be God with us, God with us in the flesh. This is going to be God in the flesh. That's hypostatic union, undiminished deity and true humanity, 100% God, 100% man in one human being like none other, who is Hebrews 1, 3, the exact representation of God himself. Philip said last Sunday, you remember, show us the father and it will be enough. He said, Philip, Phil, if I've been with you so long for three and a half years, I've shown you more of God than anybody ever in history has looked at. 
and you ask me, show me the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, Son. Yeah, that's that John 14 passage. Remember that? Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into today's study. God with us, part one. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest at Bible study to study a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality any more than you can exercise it in your life in carnality. Got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You, he's indwelt. Needs to be filled. You need, you need to be under, walking in the power of the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. How does that occur when I have sin in my life? It could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or birth sins. Here's how it works. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God. See? If we as Christians confess our sin, God will forgive us and cleanse us. God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful and just even when we're not. That's why 1 John 1, 9 works. Because of the work of Christ on the cross and because of your obedience to confess your sin when you know you have committed sin. And God is faithful to what he's told you you must do to do what he told you to do. He will do himself. He will forgive you and he will cleanse you. So, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by Internet. We pray that those on the Internet would use the same classroom etiquette that we use here, not to be distracted by phone calls and television, all the other things that could distract us, but to focus for an hour upon the teaching of the Word of God, a Christmas special. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I took a look at that, I, what I usually do with you, I give you a homiletical outline as I see it in order to bring you a lesson. And so I saw five things important to my lesson. And my lesson will kind of follow it tonight. And I'll do more doctrinal talk tomorrow night. But here's my, in verse 18, I saw Joseph discovered something that rocked his world. Agreed? He, he discovered Mary was three months pregnant. And the last time he was with Mary, um, and they were excited about the upcoming marriage. And she went to visit Elizabeth, and she spent three months with Elizabeth, and when she came back, she was three months pregnant. And that uh, rocked his world pretty good. So he's, he's got a pregnancy problem to deal with. In verse 19, uh, Joseph makes a decision he searches out the scriptures really well. How am I going to deal with this? He has two choices under Mosaic law based on the assumption that Mary's pregnancy is due to another man. He makes this assumption, right? And then opens the scriptures to see what his options are based on that idea. Agreed? So he does. He's got Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy 22. He's got Deuteronomy 24. He can get divorced. Deuteronomy 22, uh, there's the death penalty. Okay? And so he struggles through the pain, not just the pain of a relationship that he has with Mary, that has been blown apart. But the pain of divorce. Okay? In verses 20 and 21, Joseph has made a decision to divorce her and do it in private, not public. 
And God does something really good, and I want you to get this tonight. When you are positive to the Word of God and spiritually advancing, when you're positive to the Word of God, you're doing your part, you're showing up at Bible study, you're listening, you're trying to gasp, grab it and apply it to your life as best you know how. And circumstances come into your life and you seem like to be doing all the right things, asking the right questions, trying to search it all out. If you are an error, now listen to me, if you are an error on how you're progressing in this, God will intervene in your life to give you the truth. You are not making bad decisions for any other reason. Your process of thinking was screwy. Not from a human viewpoint, but from a divine viewpoint. And God will intervene. And you know this. How many times has he done that in your life and mine? Where he just stepped in and uh, gave you word. It could, be, it could be on the radio driving from point A to point B. And a guy comes on and goes like, bah, 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 and you go like, whoa, I could add a V8. You know, one of those moments. Um, I mean, we've all had that. Um, we go to somebody and we say, look, I'm just going there. They go like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's stop and think about all the ramifications this could be. There may be, and then all of a sudden they give you that way of escape like in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, so that you can bear it. You know, they give you that, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, wow, I had not thought of that. That's what happened to Joseph because, listen, why? Because God is faithful even when we're not, even when we don't know we're not. See, he's actually, look, the plan, listen, the plan of God is already in motion. Is it? Is the plan of God, look, turn in your Bibles to Galatians 4.4. 4. I want to show you what's already in force. This, in other words, the train has left the station. Okay? The train has left the station, the bus or whatever you're riding. It's left the station. Galatians 4.4. At the right time in human history. Right? God sent his son into the world at the right time in human history. Born of what? Woman, born under the law, and then what? Right, right, to redeem those under the law. All right, now what? Is Mary pregnant? Yes. How long? Three the train has left the station. For sure, for sure. <laughs> the train has left the station. In other words, the plan of God is already in, in motion, Right? So God intervenes because this thing trains life station and Joseph's not aboard on board <laughs> train went right by. You're supposed to be on that train, son. I don't think so. I think I got the next train coming this train. No, son, you're supposed to be on this train. See, so God steps in. Now, it's still a volitional warfare, isn't it? God has to deal with human volition, but he steps in because Joseph, in his heart, wants to do the right thing. And in his heart, he thinks he is. And so God sends a teaching angel into his life to show him the way. Let me tell you, I got a taxi wait, and the train is going to stop at the next stop down here in Rimlap. 
I know you didn't know the train stopped at Rimlap, but <laughs> we're going to jump on. We're going to go down, and we're going to pick the train up in Rimlap. All right? And I'm going to show you why we're going to catch the train. Okay. So God sends a teaching angel. Now, there are a lot of ways God could intervene in this, but he wants to do it volitionally. He wants to do it with the word of God. He wants to get him back on the train. In verses 22 and 23, Joseph receives divine revelation that enlightens him. You know, it's one thing to go to church. It's one thing to be given revelation. It's another thing to be enlightened by it. Enlightened shows that you have to volitionally engage in it. Agreed? Otherwise, revel listen, all revelation is designed to enlighten you. But it's volitional whether it does or not. I mean, if Joseph is given a real shot here, he can get back on the train. But he's got to make another choice because the first one caused you to miss the train. <laughs> can I ask a question? Why not? Um, if they've been taught all their lives about mm -hmm. the coming of the Messiah mm -hmm. and how he would be mm -hmm. and all this was mm -hmm. prophesied, uh -huh. why was it all of a sudden, they go, mm -hmm. they didn't believe it. Because of subjective thinking. It, just so, Wait a minute. Because of Jeff's side. Listen, this was so emotionally charged. Her pregnancy was so emotionally charged. He got subjective. How many times have we not had the answers, but got so emotionally charged, we got subjective, and you cannot apply it in subjectivity. We've all had this experience. This is an enormous emotional electric moment. Would you understand that? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can. You, I don't know why we're jumping on poor old Joseph. I don't. <laughs> He's made logical decisions. Yes, he has. Trying to do the right thing. Right. Now, when... When the, uh, yes. the angel came, if he yeah. didn't go along and didn't yeah. understand. Yeah. But yeah. it seemed like you just want to jump on and beat him up. <laughs> well, well, let's not do that. Well, he didn't know. No. Well, he did. I'm about to show it to you. Okay, please do. Yeah, I'm about to show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to help you. But I'm glad you're bringing that out, though, because what happened is, like you said, when you, when you get so, uh, your mind gets so bogged, bogged down with variation, Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Sam's got a great point. He's got a great point here. I, I want you to, and to answer his point, I, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Because God has a principle. When he puts, puts you in a, a, a situation, he never puts you in one that you can't volitionally, doctrinally think your way out of. I want you to be able to see that because if you think that he didn't have any options at this point, we're wrong because this is a big test in his life and we all get them. And God never puts you in a test situation in your life that he hasn't, he has not already prearranged, already taught you how you should respond to it. All right. But sometimes it rolls down on you with such emotional charge that you get subjective about it. Have you got 1 Corinthians 10, 13? What's it say? No testing, temptation, no temptation or trial has overtaken you. Are you with me? Now, overtaking is a very powerful word, isn't it? Overtaken you. What's it say? Is that a positive or negative? What's he, how does he introduce that? No. Well, but, but how does he start it? No temptation has overtaken you. Now, a lot of times we think it has. We get subjective about it, right? And we start making false assumptions that carry us into a spiral of bad decisions. But here's the principle. He never puts you in a situation that he hasn't pre-taught you. Okay? That, that, so that's the first part. No temptation, no testing of God, right? 
has overtaken you. See, that's how you feel, isn't it? See, that's how you feel. Overtaking. That's not true. That's not true. But that's be the way you perceive it. Okay, now what's the second part? It, what's common to man. Now watch this. Watch the third. That, that, see, this is, listen, he could, you know, common to man, you could put 10 people around this guy and say, hey, you, listen, I think you did everything right. Right? Because look, it looks normal to me. I mean, how'd she get pregnant? Right? Well, I, <laughs> you know, my science, you know, my biology teacher, everybody else sitting in a room. You know, three lawyers. <laughs> and what, what's the other part? Common demand. In other words, what's public opinion? How would you, how would you evaluate it? If, if something common to per people. Then what's third? And God is faithful. See, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted. Not let you be tempted. Beyond what you can bear. Beyond what you can. And watch the fourth, watch the fourth part of this now. It, it'll provide a way out. See, this is God's business. This is not Joseph's business. This is not Joseph's son. This is not Mary's. This is God's. It never, Bible doesn't say, this is Mary's son. I'd like you to meet Mary's son. Uh, this, this is Joseph's son. Every time they did it, it was wrong. This is the son of God. This is a hypostatic person. This is the person that was conceived of the Holy Spirit. All right. I just want you to know that what Joseph is going through, you will go through, and it will be no different in your life than it was in his. He does not, as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, he's not going to put you in a situation that he hasn't forewarned you and armed you to deal with it. And when he sees that you're not dealing with it well, according to the plan of God, he will intervene in a positive way in your life. He will give you enlightenment. This is a great example of it right here with Joseph because he comes to Joseph's rescue because he's making bad decisions. He's making bad decisions. And Joseph is going to correct it through this enlightenment. He's going to correct in verses 24, 25. He's going to get back to the directive will of God. He's going to board the train at Rimlap and go on home. And what's going to happen, listen, when you do that, watch what happens. The plan of God is reactivated in your life. You're back on, you're back on track. Now, let me show you. Let me show you a few things. This, I, th I hope this will be helpful to you. Joseph discovers Mary's three months pregnant after a three-month visit with Elizabeth, Matthew 118, Luke 24, uh, 30 through 38, 56. That's for your study. And, and listen, God was with Mary working his plan out in her life, and he's with Joseph. Now listen to me. Both of these guys are into the plan of God. They live to fulfill the plan of God in their life. He's working it out in Mary's life, and he's working it out in Joseph's life. Do you understand? That's true in yours and mine. He's always about working his plan out in your life. That's God's business. Your business is let him do it. That's your business. Yours is to let him do it. In Luke 1, 27, it says, a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. This is Luke's account. A virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. In Matthew 1, we look, we now pan ram off from Mary's house over to Joseph's house. Okay? Mary lives over, over a mountain, and, and Joseph lives out by Rimlap. And so we pan ram over to Joseph. And, and, and it says, when his mother Mary had been betrothed, we just read that, to Joseph before they came together. In other words, they are legally contracted for marriage. And before they came together sexually, she was found to be with child. Uh, and then I went in and as I described, the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? 
So there's your scenario. We got two, we've got two spiritual mature believers that is engaged in the plan of God. And God is working both of these to bring his, his son of God into the world according to the plan of God. Ready? And he has handpicked, he has handpicked two people to parent his child. Okay? All right. Here's point number two. Joseph makes a decision to divorce Mary. All the paperwork was done and only needed to be signed he decided to sleep on it before finalizing the divorce. That's how deeply passionate he was about this. Joseph is described as her husband, contracted to be married, a righteous man that's spiritually mature, not wanting to disgrace her, that shows his motivation, but plans to send her away privately, in other words, to divorce her, to divorce her privately, not publicly. If Mary got pregnant, here's the issue that he's facing under Mosaic law. If Mary got pregnant after engagement to Joseph by another man, Joseph has two scriptural choices. He can divorce her publicly or privately, Deuteronomy 24, Matthew 5 talks about it in chapter 19 as well. He could give her mercy or death, public or private, and show wrath. In other words, the law, let, let the law deal with it in Deuteronomy 22. That's pretty tough, isn't it? But he had those two choices based on the fact that she is pregnant by another man other than himself and their betrothed. Agreed? All right. Joseph chose to divorce privately, and he tells it, and his motivation is given. But we need to pause here and teach an important doctrinal lesson about making sure our decisions are accurately based on the directive will of God regarding any issue in our life. Okay? Because he thinks. He's doing the right thing, and he is not. How would he know? I'm about to tell you. Don't get ahead of me. Stay with me. Yeah, we we know. Well, we know we know that we know First Corinthians ten thirteen that God would never put him in the situation he had if he hadn't pre-programmed him. That's a principle. That's a doctrinal principle that the Bible will will show you every time you look at it. Okay, that's an important principle. Now, Joseph was so sure about Mary's situation and his choices and the right decision for him, it would have been nearly impossible to talk him out of it. Okay? He was confident that he had thought it out carefully. There was a problem as a spiritual mature believer that many of us make, and you better pay attention. He made a false assumption. I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you. He made a false assumption. All right? He made, I'm, I'm going to tell you. He made a false assumption. She's pregnant but not by another man. How would he know that? Well, he had the Bible. He had a Bible. And he opened it because he assumed that she was pregnant by another man. He didn't search it well enough. Is there any scripture of a virgin giving birth in the Bible? Yes. A scripture that was as big as John 3.16 in the Old Testament. It was Isaiah 7.14. He didn't investigate all of the options scripturally. It would have been very clear had he looked. And listen, it was well knowledgeable 
that Christ would come this way in the world because Isaiah was about as big a prophet as you could get. Isaiah was the great prophet. It is Isaiah 7.14 that says that the Son of God will come by a virgin and we'll call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us, hypostatic man. That he would not come through a father. He would not come through a male. Emmanuel means he will not come through a male. He will be God with us. It is Isaiah that writes about the crucifixion in the 53rd chapter that Paul says the gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. According to the scriptures, he's quoting Isaiah 53. It is Isaiah in the 28th chapter in verse 11 that he is forewarning that tongues would come with the absence of when the Messiah would go back to the Father, tongues would be a key issue to Israel to tell them that the fifth cycle of discipline was coming because they murdered their Messiah. Uh, 11. So he makes a mistake that many of us make. We think we know what we don't know and make decisions off from what we don't know. If he went to the scriptures to look for divorce and he thought it out very carefully, he thought it out so well that he was absolutely convinced that he was making a right decision. This is why God intervened and didn't hold him accountable, right? He did that. But listen, what should have Joseph done? He should have investigated the scriptures. He was mature enough to know Isaiah was bigger than life. He was the messianic prophet. Was there any indication in biblical, in biblical history that he grew up with that would say, listen, they, they understood the virgin birth for the Messiah as much as we do. We just look at it historically. They had it prophetically. You don't, you don't know anything about the virgin birth and the birth of Jesus Christ apart from the scriptures, do you? No. And if you did, you wouldn't take him as serious as the scriptures. He had that. He had as much evidence for this as you have historically in the scriptures. I mean, I'm, I'm bringing you Matthew 1 and 2. Wouldn't it be awfully presumptuous of him to think that they're talking about me and, and, and Mary? Did he have any indication that that's who they, they, Isaiah was prophesying? No, well, that's, that's true with all of us, isn't it? Yeah. No, they didn't know. I mean, this became a real surprise to him and Mary too. Right? But listen, it shouldn't surprise us when God shows up and says, you know why I've been training you? I want you to do this. So I went through this when, when, when I got the call to preach. I mean, a bird didn't come down and say, Ron, we, you know, I didn't get any call out of heaven. I mean, I really struggled with this whole idea. I really struggled with being a pastor of a church. Man, I didn't mind going around and talk about Jesus a little bit. I didn't want to pastor no church. I wouldn't put up with all the stuff. I didn't want to do it. I mean, I was a member of a church. I understood what goes on in a church. I mean, I know what I did. But look, at, here, here's my point. Here's what I want to make you sure, make sure you get tonight. He made a false assumption. That's for sure. Agreed? Yeah. He made a false assumption. Based on the word of God, he made a false assumption. She was not pregnant by a man. She was pregnant, but not by a man. And so he's basing everything off a of false assumption. Now, we know that once you get, make a decision off a false assumption, it leads to a, a false interpretation, a false expectation, a false application. In other words, when, when you start, I call it a snowball on top of a hill. You make this little snowball on top of a hill, that's a, and, and, you, and you push that. If the snow, if the conditions are perfect, when that thing gets to the bottom of that hill, it's not a little snowball anymore. What happened, he makes a false assumption and that snowball of bad decisions began because we learned this out of, uh, 
out of, uh, where was it? Ezekiel Proverbs or someplace. Uh, no, J Job. When we were studying Job, we discovered this principle. A false assumption leads to a f false interpretation, to a false expectation, false application. This, uh, so that snowball, listen, by the time, by the, t by the time God intervenes with this, this thing has got into an avalanche of destruction in the plan of God. You understand that? That's why this story is an important story. Listen, this could happen to anybody in this room. It could happen to anybody in this room. You, you've got to ask yourself, what is going on here in my life right now? How is this possible? I mean, how is it? How is this possible? How is this possible that's going on in my life? You've got to search all the scriptures. You've got to pay attention to everything in the word of God. What was it when God came to him and said to him, you know what he gave him? He gave him Isaiah 7, 14. He gave him a Bible verse that he knew well in his soul. He never called it up because it never crossed his mind that Mary and Joseph would be the parents of the Messiah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times God puts his hand on you to do certain things that you look around the room and say, you must be talking to somebody else, right? You must be talking to somebody else because that's not me. And I can tell you right now, I mean, this is the way I talk to God. I am not going to do it. <laughs> and listen, I'm here doing it because I got enlightenment about what was going to happen. Look, it, you know, as a good parent, you want your kids to do the right thing as you understand the right thing for their life. And you're going to make, but listen, here's my point. Here's your point, my point. He makes a false assumption. Makes a false assumption. Mary was pregnant. He, he assumes Mary's pregnant by another man. That wasn't true. Every believer who walks more by sight than by faith would have completely agreed with Joseph against the plan of God. But had he, had he looked at all of the options? No, he didn't. He only looked at the ones that he assumed to be true, which weren't. The, the reality in life was it was not true, right? It wasn't true. She was not pregnant by another man. That was not true. Was not true. And could he have found out it? Yeah. How do I know? Because the, listen, the, the angels showed up and quoted Isaiah 7, 14, right out of his Bible. He could have said, you know what, Joseph? You could have went to the concordance and found the virgin, and you would have found it in Isaiah. Can a virgin, can a virgin have a baby in Israel? Can a Judean woman, virgin, have a baby? Is there any history of it? Listen, it was lights out history. The virgin birth was as big then as it is the concept as it is to here. It was a prophetic thing there. It's a historical thing now. You don't have a problem believing the virgin. Well, you may have a problem with it, but I mean, did it happen? Yeah. Do we believe it happened? Sure. How do we know? The Bible says so. Did he have that Bible? Yep. Could he have found it? Yeah. Did he look for it? No. So what do we learn? When something comes around and you look at it, maybe in the, maybe the human view of it is not good enough. Maybe you should get a divine look at it. Maybe you should look at all the options the Bible has to say about it. This, he never, listen, but listen, he's open to the truth. And when the angel shows up in the middle of his sleep, deep sleep dream, and teaches Isaiah 7, 14, he knows it. He, you understand? He gives him a scripture he's already identified. When this angel goes like, 
Isaiah 7, 14, it's like, it's like somebody giving you John 3, 16. It's in the middle of the night. He is in deep sleep, and he shows up and gives them Isaiah 7, 14. You know why? Because he has in his right lobe identity with it. Do you know how I know it? Because when he got up, he did it. I'm telling you, there's a lesson here you must not miss. False assumptions can turn into an avalanche in your life. False assumption, Mary's pregnant by another man. False interpretation, scriptural divorce or death. False expectation, must divorce, but I don't want to disgrace. False application, Joseph chose private divorce all outside the plan of God. Yeah, Joseph's a common man. I mean, Sam, I relate to him. I have no problem with that. What do we learn from this story? Pay attention to the word of God. You come to Bible study, he teaches you. Then you go off. He wants you to put it. Listen, once you believe it and teach it, he puts it in the right lobe of your heart. And you may make all kinds of bad decisions, but that's there. You're not, you haven't considered it. You never considered it. And then when you did, you may not like it. I mean, I never considered God wanted me. Then I did, when I did, I went like, I thought I could choose. Well, I could be an evangelist. I could be this. I could be that. So I decided I... This mind to choose. I think I'll do it. I mean, I could have been a doctor. I could have been this. I could have been that. I thought I could do it in the kingdom. <laughs> Not so. Not so. Because the kingdom doesn't work like the common world. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. So at some point, you got to get compatible with the will of God. At some point, and listen, I love this about Joseph. When that, listen, when it went ding, ding, when that, when that, when that angel showed up and said, I got a scripture for you that's going to solve your whole problems. I got a verse. You didn't look at it, but here's the verse. And he quotes it. Listen, here's what happens. That scripture in his right lobe that he hadn't brought out to discuss and look at, it was too far removed from him, probably because he was Joseph. How could this happen to me? That this could possibly be. Mary can't possibly be that person. I can't possibly be this guy. The truth of the matter, it was. And listen, when the guy said, well, listen, Joseph, this is Isaiah 7, 14, and you've got a role here. You're in this story. Joseph, you're in that scripture. That scripture has laid dormant, listen to me now, for 700 years. The only time you ever heard of this was in Bible study. And when he heard that verse, he had that ding, ding bell that goes off, that goes like, ching, ching. And when that happened, he was enlightened by revelation on a scripture he already knew didn't pull up. I don't want to second guess him. Man, I don't know if any of us have done that. I've been in those, not those shoes, but I've been in shoes like that where I began to make false assumptions. There's a real danger in this, and I hope you get this. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say that Joseph, we may have all done what he did, right? And listen, we probably do in our own life do these kind of things. But let me tell you the good part of this. If you're doing it, because I, I, I just missed it, Lord. I missed it. I mean, I missed it. I mean, there's no way I would have ever thought that Mary and I would have been the actors in that play. There's no way. Listen, God knows I. And he shows up and he goes like, I want to enlighten you. You are the actor in that play. And you go like,
people often ask me, you know, Ron, you use that snowball a lot. I do. Because I was coming out of, of North Carolina, and God had put on my heart, I want you to pastor a church. And I said, there's no way I am ever going to pastor a church. <laughs> so, there's no way. I'm absolutely perfectly happy working for Billy Graham. I'm fulfilling everything I need. I'm getting a paycheck. I, I'm, I'm content. Isn't it enough? Listen, God, isn't it enough that I'm content? Well, he says, not unless I am. <laughs> yeah, not, not unless I am. And I've told this story many times, but this is where that snowball comes from, my, my illustrations. That car began going down, spinning out of control, going down a big old mountain in North Carolina. Oh, Rick, Rick Hughes was with me. I mean, and that thing would go over on that side, you know, spinning, it'd go that side, and we go, woo! <laughs> he'd come on that side. And we go like, whew, then it'd go back, ah! and then it'd come back. By halfway down that mountain, that thing stopped on the mountainside, the upside, just pulled over and stopped. Rick, you said to me, I'm going to have to know something right now. Because we had been talking about this. And I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. He said, either you consent to doing this. Or I'm going to get out, walk down this thing, and I'm going home whatever way I can get home, but it ain't going to be riding with you. <laughs> and I said, well, he said, how is it possible that you don't want to do the will of God? Now, you know you have the gift. We all know that. There's nobody that knows that. Why is it that you don't want to do this? I said, well, I can tell you why. He went, I, I don't know. They said, confess your sin, tell God, and, we'll, and listen to me. I'll get out, and we'll push this car out. We'll get to the bottom of the hill. <laughs> this is Rick Hughes. I mean, he, he said, when we get to the bottom of that hill, you're going to make a call to Graham in my presence, and you're going to tell him what you're going to do. You're going to quit. You're going to give, give that notice. You're going to quit. You're going to tell him you're going into the pastoral ministry. Or you and I are going to have time at the bottom of this hill. You and I are going to have some more kind of time. So when I got down to the bottom of the hill, so we had prayer up there. I confessed my sin. He confessed his. Listen, we all confess so many sins going down that mountain. Oh, I mean, we covered a whole lot. Oh, God. And um, I, called, I called Billy. I called the Graham organization and resigned that day. Came home without a job. It's the best thing. Best thing. What? Not, not going down a hill. <laughs> but see, I didn't have to do that. God, but listen, God will intervene in your life. So I talk about snowball creating an avalanche a lot. If you want to know where I got that, that's where I got that. God intervened. Brought a teaching angel into a deep sleep dream. I mean, is not God wonderful how he reaches our life? I mean, it's just amazing to me. I love first, uh, 2 Timothy 2.13. God is faithful in, even when we are faithless. Or, or when we're mis, misguided in our faith. We may not be faithless. Our faith is just misguided. I mean... The circumstances in our life can be so crazy and so far out there that there's no way to even presume, you see. And I, I, I like what he says when he says, now all this took place. <laughs> all this took place in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Listen, all that, all that stuff that Joseph went through was to fulfill a prophecy as a kid he learned, as a young man he learned, but never believed it could be possible, it could ever possibly be him. 
And it says, now all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And he's talking about Isaiah. <laughs> Listen, it wasn't fulfilled. It wasn't to fulfill the stuff Joseph was going through, much of it being self-induced, but to fulfill the directive will of God in his life and in jo Mary and Joseph's life. I mean, what's God's intention with all this? Fulfill his will in your life. The directive will. Well, as far as I can get tonight. Sam, have we, have we, have we, have we made, have we made his life a little better? I just think it was a little too rough. <laughs> <laughs> there's no evidence that I know of that Mary said anything to him. Well, it, there's probably, probably so. I mean, somehow or another, they've got a good look at each other. Oh, well, yeah. Right. So, you know, I'm thinking she's probably come home and said, he goes like, you gained a little weight, ain't you, honey? <laughs> and she goes like, I got some, something to tell you. Because he discovered it. I don't know. You know, we didn't have all this stuff. We got, you know, all this electronic. I mean, she's got to have told him the story. Huh? Says so. But who knows? I'll tell you who benefited from this whole thing. God, and you and me, right? You and me. You and me. Well, yep. Let's let me close down. Father, we're thankful tonight for our study. God with us, and uh, how wonderful Joseph discovered God with him before Christ would be three months, three months pregnant and all this is happening. Boy, don't you know, whoo, what is this going to be like? What in the world is this going to be like? Well, this child not only changed their life, but it is changed ours. Because this child is going to become Emmanuel, God with us. I'm so thankful for that. And we've looked at two common people, just believers. But you know, in Christ, we're not common. In Christ, we're special. Nothing normal about us, but everything abnormal in Christ. The supernatural has touched our life in the most amazing ways. May we be that person. I like Joseph. He got up and went and did the Lord's will. Who uh, kudos for Joseph. Just like Mary. I mean, mm. encourage your hearts this Christmas with that story, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.